Now? Yes. OK, so hello, everyone. Uh, that's me. Uh, I work at Novoda. Um, I lo work in London. We have an office here in Berlin, so you might know someone from Novoda, probably that guy. Um, or him, or ish. Ish. <laughs> yeah, I'm a freelancer, but I just work from. <laughs> Don't be scared, it's okay. Uh, so, um, today we're going to talk about the canvas, and if you're anything like me, that is the canvas face. That is the face you do when you work with the canvas. There's sometimes someone behind you looking pretty much the same, but that's a different story. Um, so, why is it so confusing? It's confusing because it's a really big thing. The, the Canvas API has a really big surface, uh, and it's not always super clear what does what. So, first of all, we need to start defining what the Canvas is, because you might have used the API, but not knowing exactly what was going on. So, first thing, what is the Canvas? So, the Canvas is... Uh, as in real life, it's. Huh? I don't have a volume, I think. I'm just. No? Is there a volume thingy? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to be super loud. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll keep going in the meantime, and then when my voice just goes off, it means they, they've done something. Um, so. Canvas is the API that is involved in any kind of UI drawing on Android. Um, it's uh, actually what you use, what you deal with uh, when, uh, when you do uh, any kind of graphics fancy uh, stuff. Uh, but it all boils down underneath it uh, to drawing stuff uh, on a buffer, and that buffer can be either a buffer uh, that is stored in software, so in the RAM, or in hardware, so in a separate, different uh, place on the device, on a different chip. Um, as I said, the canvas is actually not just the canvas object, the canvas class. There's a lot more stuff that goes on uh, there. Um, so we will see a few of them, not all of them, because it would take probably days to go through all of them, but we will talk mostly about canvas and paint. Um, paint, uh, I'm just going to briefly introduce it, is, uh, again, the, the metaphor with real life uh, extends into drawing uh, UIs, meaning you have a canvas, and you might have a brush, but if you don't have any paint, you will not draw anything. So what paint does is the role that paint does in real life. Uh, unfortunately, um, documentation is not always ideal. Um, so yeah, I think, actually, to be completely fair, it's improving from time to time. They add stuff. Uh, there has been something like higher level added recently that we will see later. But yeah, in general, there is no, uh, no way of getting the big picture. So you can go and see the documentation for one class, and you might understand how that works. Or you might be not as lucky, and you might need to go and see the Java code. But most of the time, the Java code is just calling through JNI to native code. So you will need to go and look at the native code, and maybe that helps, maybe not. Um, underneath the canvas is a library, an uh, open source library, which is called uh, Skia. Skia is, as I said, the native code part that does all the magic of drawing stuff on screen. Uh, it's used not only in Android, but in uh, Chrome and Chrome OS as well. Um, and it's basically uh, a toolkit, uh, simply uh, a 2D rendering toolkit uh, that has both the, the most bas basic uh, painting capabilities you would expect, like drawing a shape or uh, filling with colors and stuff, but can also be quite flexible and it has some uh, 
nice and advanced features. Uh, you can customize the way uh, stuff works, and we'll see some of those. And unfortunately, there's no time for all of them. And at the same time, Skia has issues. Uh, for example, uh, what you see here is uh, an attempt to, do, to draw arcs. If you draw, if you, um, draw arcs uh, using Skia, you might see that sometimes, even though the arcs are exactly starting and ending at the same points and with the same uh, center and radius, they, they don't exactly match. So you have like these small issues here. And if you run into those issues, well, bad luck. Really bad luck. Because you would have to do all the generation of the, heart of the arcs yourself. And then it's really a pain. And also, Skia is not really good at handling text. I mean, it's good enough. But if you need to do advanced stuff, it's, uh, it's not available. It's simply not available. Uh, to be fair, Skia isn't doing the text rendering itself. It's just um, de uh, delegating all the calls to a uh, free text uh, rendering engine that in turn uses a text render that is provided by Adobe starting from Android 4.2. Um, and then again, there is no documentation. So uh, the documentation for Skia is the Skia code. Uh, so if you have issues with text rendering, you have to go and look at, for example, uh, SK uh, text paint if you have issues with text paint, which is the native counterpart to the text paint in UC from Java. Um, but in all fairness, there is still yeah, good stuff going on. Uh, for example, uh, Skia is able to uh, leverage the hardware of your, de of your device to make rendering faster. So uh, there is a subset of, uh, of Skia, which is called Hardware UI, that was introduced in um, Honeycomb. Uh, it's using OpenGL ES2 and the GPU to, uh, to perform the drawing operations. Um, to us, uh, we're not going to talk about hardware UI in specific, because it's pretty much, from the Java perspective, is the same thing. You don't really need to know about it, its existence unless you hit one of the uh, limitations, because doing stuff on the CPU, it's slower, but it's more flexible than you, what you can do on a GPU. So there are some limitations. Uh, and when you do hit one of those limitations, you have to say to the canvas, OK, no, wait, don't use the GPU, because that thing I'm trying to do is not possible to do there. So you have to revert to software rendering, which is, again, slower. Um, just to give you a brief idea of how it works, uh, this is a couple of uh, tables that you find on the Android developers website that shows you uh, which operations are not supported on the GPU. It's actually not, uh, I don't think, th these are the only two tables you find, but I don't think they are exhaustive. There are other stuff that might not be working. But the good thing is, even if they are a bit uh, outdated, because it's like they go out to version 18 of the SDK, but you can see the trend is improving over time. So hopefully uh, the team, the, the Canvas team and the Skia team are uh, aiming to get feature parity between uh, hardware and software rendering. So I strongly, strongly recommend you to go and uh, to go and see uh, the documentation for for the hardware acceleration on the Android developers website because it's pretty well done and at least gives you an idea of what you can, what you cannot do, and what you should not do because they. The way hardware acceleration works is a bit different from the way software rendering works. So some operations are better not done when you, you are using hardware acceleration. So for example, uh, giving that, given that everything has to be uploaded to the GPU to be rasterized and rendered and shown on screen, uh, you, should not, uh, you should try to avoid as much as possible uh, changing small things all the time because that requires the, the whole texture to be re-uploaded to the GPU, and that takes time. That said, let's go back to the canvas. How do we use it? 
yeah, can we have questions at the end, if you don't mind, just to, okay, sorry. Um, so, um, back to the canvas. How do you use the canvas? Um, well, it's mostly about uh, transformations, so to move stuff around, you use matrices, so linear algebra, I hope you like it, uh, or avoid it, I don't know. Uh, so you can scale, transform, and do all the usual stuff in 2D uh, using matrices on, on a canvas. There's also another uh, API within uh, the Canvas API, which is called the camera, which allows you to do pseudo 3D uh, transformations. So it adds uh, the third dimension. Um, but yeah, it's not super, super easy to, to understand because it's using uh, some units, which are weird units, not exactly matching pixels. So it's hard to understand exactly how that works. It's mostly trial and error, they won. Um, so another thing about the canvas is that uh, the canvas is, um, uh, sorry, I'm just skipping ahead, I'm sorry. When you do use the canvas APIs, you have to be on the main thread because all the rendering has to be performed on the main thread because Skia expects to be running on in a certain um, condition, which is basically mapping being on the main thread in Android terms. Uh, so if you have custom views, you cannot just spawn some, uh, some thread and have it doing uh, the painting on a canvas. You have to be on the main thread. Uh, so that limits you in the time you have to actually do the whole um, uh, layout, uh, measurement, layout, and drawing cycle to mil 16 milliseconds, which is one on 60, which is 60 frames per second, which is what you should aim to have if you want your app to feel responsive to the user. Um, if you have really particular needs or you need to do really weird stuff, you can use something like a surface view or a texture view that basically give you access to the, to the buffer, the underneath buffer, and you can use it as you like, but there is a big drawback, which is you're not synchronized with the, with the GPU. So if you do stuff, you have to synchronize with the V-Sync of the screen yourself. The V-Sync is the moment where the screen is drawn. Uh, so just do it if you really need to also, because it's usually a lot of pain. And it's more pain for developers. It's like, no, we already have enough. Um, one last thing about the canvas is the canvas is stateful. Uh, what does that mean? The canvas has a state, which is, uh, since a canvas is shared between everything that is uh, inside of a window, every view gets a reference to it in its uh, on-draw method, and uh, that reference is then, you use it, you act on it in your, in your view, you paint stuff on it, you might transform it and scale it and rotate it and whatever, uh, but then you have to make sure that you return it to the exact same state you got it in. That is because if you don't, then the next view that gets the canvas will find all the stuff moved around and they, they start with the assumption that the canvas is in the state they should find it in. So if you move stuff around, you have to remember doing one thing, which is calling state uh, save to save the state of the canvas before you start drawing. Uh, that's that's really all there is to it. You call save or save to count if you want to have uh, a state ID, then you can keep, so you don't really have to match uh, the number of save and restore calls. So what you do is you call save you call or save to count, you do all your drawing transformations and stuff, and then you call restore or restore to count if you use save to count, which will do all the tedious uh, work of rolling back all your transformations for you so you don't have to calculate, for example, inverse transformations to undo what you've done before. It will do, oh, it will do it for you. Um, <coughs> it's time for a top tip. So, <laughs> I woke you up. Did that work? Cool. <laughs> um, if you want to uh, draw stuff, like assume you want to have some items, some stuff in a view that is supposed to be 
a composite of things, but has to be uh, translucent. If you just draw stuff yourself, uh, like you have, I don't know, a background and some text, and you want the background to be semi-transparent and the text to be semi-transparent as well, and then you want to overlay it over other stuff that has uh, translucency or uh, transparency itself, you would have to calculate all the alphas yourself uh, and then compose it back. It's a pain. So there is a way, that the way that the framework does this, uh, which is, by the way, what happens behind the scenes when you set the alpha for review, um, is that it uses um, variation, of a variant of the save method, which is called save layer alpha, uh, which is a method of uh, Canvas. And then it does all the drawing, pretending nothing happened, like I'm just doing my stuff. And then when you call restore after uh, save to layer, everything you have drawn up to that point was not actually drawn on the canvas you were working on, but instead everything was uh, sent to a separate buffer that you didn't see, you don't realize it's there, but it's there. So you're painting on a separate place and then everything is uh, copied back to the main canvas using uh, a global alpha value. Um, I know this is hard to understand, so I made an example with, uh, so assume this is your canvas, and your canvas has some stuff on it, for example, underpants gnomes. Um, and what you want to do is you want to add some text with a background that has to be translucent. So what you do is, first of all, you call save layer alpha. What this, do, what this does is it creates an off-screen buffer, so everything you paint from that moment on will be drawn on there. And so you draw your background, which is going to be a fill, uh, fill a rectangle, uh, just whatever you want, the color you like. Then you draw your text. And once you're done, we, yeah, that's what we wanted to do, so you call restore to count. and. Everything you have drawn in the uh, off-screen buffer is now composited back to the original canvas and profit. Okay, so we have seen a couple of things for Java APIs and stuff, but the really interesting part about canvas is underneath. So what what's going on? How do you? How does it actually work? How does it get stuff from your code to the screen? Um, there are a few things uh, that you need to know about it. So Android uses Skia to, uh, as a drawing uh, toolkit, but everything is actually done using the concept of surface. So a surface is basically a buffer. So just like Canvas is drawing on a buffer, well, that buffer is actually a surface. Uh, a surface is a low-level concept of a buffer um, that uh, can that is managed in the kernel space by Surface Flinger. Surface Flinger is is a native component of uh, of Android that um, is responsible for managing all the surfaces. So, for example, if you create a new window, like a new activity, that will be backed by a surface. So everything you draw on the activity will then be taken care of from the surface flinger. And the surface flinger can be um, using something that is a software buffer. So again, something that uh, is living inside of the RAM of your uh, device. Or it can be using a hardware uh, buffer, which is um, a portion of memory on a separate, uh, on a separate 2D blitzer usually the GPU, um, and the sor uh, software surface flingers use a uh, software instance of OpenGL ES1, uh, whereas the hardware ones, as I said, use um, OpenGL ES2, hey, tweet, I guess, um, and yeah, tweets, they confuse me. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, that, that was pretty much it anyway. So if you want to read more, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm just, um, if you want to read more about how things work uh, at low level, 
there is a really good and quite recent uh, write-up on the uh, Android uh, open source project website. So you know what AOSP is now, if you should know. Um, on the website, they have this really long and good write-up. It goes really in, deep, in depth, so take some time. It's not easy at all. Um, OK, let's go a bit more towards the not towards the surface, that's confusing, uh, towards Java. <laughs> so the way you see a surface from Java, from uh, Canvas APIs, is uh, they call them layers, uh, pretty much. They're pretty much the same. So layers are those buffers that are residing somewhere, and they are surfaces again. And every Canvas is tied to one layer and can actually spawn more than one, as we have seen with the uh, save layer alpha. In that case, it was creating another layer, not which I called off screen buffer, and uh, doing stuff on that. And then again, as in save layer alpha, uh, it can be blitted back using a uh, paint. Blit means copying pixels from one place to the other. Um, so you can use any uh, paint you want to copy back, so a paint can have an alpha, can have various properties, and that affects the way stuff is drawn. Um, and I mean, layers are pretty much like surfaces, and so again, here as well, we have software and hardware layers, and there's even uh, no uh, buffer kind of thing, which I never understood exactly what that means. Um, but if you have a view, starting from Honeycomb, you have a method uh, which is called set layer type, and you can set which kind of layer you want your view to be backed in. So before Honeycomb, the default was uh, using a software layer, uh, which is a portion of your system memory where you just put, put the pixel information in. Uh, hardware as is basically telling it that it should be using some portion of a surface that is backed in hardware um, and is managed by uh, OpenGLES, again, using hardware UI. Um, the advantage of using hardware, the reason why they actually did it, is that you, uh, once you have computed the, the, the set of instructions needed to draw something, you don't need to uh, do it every single frame. It's just instead of storing uh, the actual pixel values, when you use hardware rendering, it's storing a set of operations, and that is then used to create some kind of texture, texture which is a bitmap to then get shown on screen. So it's useful, for example, for animations, because if you do animate something, the GPU can do all the work for you. You just upload the texture, the, the stuff you want to draw once, and tell the GPU, OK, move it there, set the alpha, and stuff like that. So that is the reason uh, why Android is using uh, hardware acceleration. It's basically leveraging the, uh, the hardware to have more uh, drawing performances. OK, all good. Maybe uh, you probably fall as fell asleep, I don't know, whatever. Uh, but OK, let's now just connect what we have seen in the beginning with what we've just seen. So we started from really high above, from Java, from the canvas, and then we moved to really close to the metal, so down to the native layer. And we want to close the gap and see what happens, because, yeah, we have We've said that we're using Skia, but we have never seen it, actually. Um, all the Canvas APIs are pretty much mapping APIs that are in Skia. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have the whole weekend to talk about that, so we're just going to talk about Paint for now, uh, which is the probably most important API in uh, the Canvas toolbox. Uh, because Paint contains all the information that Skia needs to paint stuff, to uh, color pixels, and to do its operations. And as such, it's something that Skia has to keep uh, bring along all the drawing pipeline 
uh, from the moment you tell it to do something to the moment it's actually done because it contains all the, infor the, the information. So paint uh, has a lot of properties and all those properties come together in different steps of the pipeline um, to contribute to the final result. Um, every single drawing called on uh, canvas is requiring a paint parameter because again as I said in the beginning if you try to paint with a canvas and a brush and no paint well good luck um, paint does part of the text handling as well uh, it's not responsible for painting the text itself but contains all the information needed for to paint the text it's like uh, there is a um, subclass of paint which is called text paint that contains uh, even more information about the text such as uh, line height and uh, all different things and paint itself contains uh, information about which uh, font which is called typeface in canvas terms uh, are you're using the size and whatever uh, we have mentioned the pipeline the skia pipeline um, this is a really high level uh, version of the Skia pipeline. I, I stole the, the graph and just tweaked it a bit. I didn't do it. I'm not that good. Um, the really interesting thing about the, the Skia pipeline you can see in this graph is that it's basically four main uh, steps that contribute to the final image. Um, I'm just going to go really quickly about some of them. Uh, if you want to know more about every single thing, a good starting point is the place where I stole this image from, uh, which is um, this article by Lorenz Gonzalez, I guess that's the pronunciation, uh, on, uh, on his uh, website. So, paint. Um, is, as I said, paint is carried through, yeah? Yes. I'm counting down. Five, four, three, two, one. Done? Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll just, just come over later and I'll give you the, the link again. Um, so, we have seen the pipeline is composed by four main uh, steps, which are um, the path rendering, uh, rasterization, uh, shading, and uh, uh, compositing, which is called in a different way, but that's what I remember now. Um, every single uh, step has got two phases, and I'm going to contradict myself in a, in a bit, um, but that's the general idea when uh, dealing with, uh, with the steps. So it's kind of a two-pass strategy. If you ever uh, rendered a video, you might know that there are codecs that do stuff in two passes. The first one is just getting the rough idea of where stuff will go, and the second one is making it super nice. And the same goes for Skia. So uh, every single, uh, every single uh, step has two phases-ish again, uh, and those phases are called uh, generally effects. And each effect uh, modify the output. So a step, uh, an effect, gets its input and transforms it and gives a different uh, result or or not. For example, the the in throughout the pipeline, uh, the second step by uh, the second phase of each step by default is uh, an identity transform. So it doesn't do anything. It just gets something and is out uh, but the second step is usually the ones th is usually the one uh, that you uh, that you act on because the the rough the, the most important part of the work is done in the first in the first effect and then the second one is used to refine it so let's start let, I'll just completely skip the path uh, rendering uh, uh, the path creation uh, step because it's mostly random stuff. Uh, just like uh, it's responsible for getting a 
an idea of the outline of the stuff you're drawing, and then it passes it to the second uh, to the second phase, which is called the rasterization phase. Um, the rasterization phase gets like this the, the the actual area you're gonna affect with your paint coals, and uh, creates what is called uh, alpha mask. The alpha mask is like a stencil, so you know you get this card card with the cutout, and then you paint through it. So that's what the, the alpha mask does. Um, the mask filters are uh, the I wouldn't say the second phase of rasterization because I said I was going to contradict myself and now it's happening. Um, so the rasterization phase is a bit different from the others uh, because it can consist of two different things. It can be um, using a, a two-step um, two behavior like we, we will see for others. So you see two, uh, two balls. But it's actually one, just one, because if you use the other one, the other one is not an effect. It's like for the rasterization phase, you can set a rasterizer, which is basically taking over the whole step. So in this case, it's not. It's probably something you will never do. Will never have to do. So the, the interesting part of the rasterization phase is the mask filters. Uh, mask filters are not hardware accelerated. If you do set the mask filter on a hardware layer, that's this thing here is actually split in half, not because I'm really bad at applying things, but also, but uh, the top part is actually a software layer and the bottom part is a hardware layer. As you can see, the blurring I applied was actually not applied on the on the lower part, which is rendered rendered with hardware. Uh, that is because mask filters are um, when you use them on a hardware layer are actually defaulting to identity. They don't do anything uh, because uh, limitations with the capabilities of um, of a GPU. Um, really quickly, the mask filters you have at your disposal uh, in Android and in Skia in general are two blur. That one, and emboss. Um, emboss is really you probably never needed in your whole life, so it's just it's not a big deal. You don't have it. Uh, if you need to blur stuff, you might need to do some crazy. You you can do it in your code. You can use the NDK to blur, which is faster than doing it, doing it in Java. Or you can even use render script. If you want to use uh, render script to blur things, like to pre-compute them. Uh, uh, mask uh, and then blur it. You can use render script. There's a nice series of uh, blog posts that Mark Allison has uh, done on his uh, styling Android blog that will work, walk you through the whole process. Um, that said, that's all about uh, the rasterization phase. We're just going to skip to the shading phase. So the shading phase is. Uh, is the most interesting one, if you want. If you want, um, it's composed of. This is really the case this time. It's two uh, passes. The first pass is uh, using shaders. Uh, the effect name is uh, for the first pass of the shading phase is shaders. It's confusing. Um, so shaders, if you probably have heard of shaders, is pretty much the same as in uh, uh, in uh, OpenGL. Um, pixel shaders are pretty much the same. The main difference between the canvas uh, shaders and the OpenGL shaders is that the canvas shaders are not programmable, which means once you create a shader, it's immutable and you cannot change it. So if you want to vary the intensity of the effect of a shader or just tweak the values over time, you need to create a new shader every time and it takes time, consumes memory and stuff. So. That's a limitation. Theoretically, Skia can support programmable, programmable shaders, but that's not available on the Java layer. So, tough luck. Um, one thing about shaders, well, shaders are responsible to uh, of dictating the color of the pixels. So, 
we have seen in the, in the path and rasterization, what they do is they define the area where to paint, and shaders, on the other hand, they define what to paint. So a shader is, doesn't have really an idea of where it's going to paint. It just knows it's going to paint something. It knows what to paint, uh, whereas the alpha mask will tell it where to paint. Uh, shaders, as I said, don't know where to paint, so there is a, you define your painting bounds on the canvas, and you can tell shaders uh, how to manage uh, drawing outside of their comfort zone. Uh, <laughs> for example, a shader that will fill uh, with a solid color doesn't have any problem because it's like whatever pixel it's applied to is going to set the color to that thing. But you might have like a texture, a bitmap. Um, in that case, the bitmap has a, a size, and if you need to paint uh, an area that is bigger than the, the size of the bitmap, it needs to know how to deal with it. So there's why you have tile mode. Tile mode is telling the shader how to treat areas outside of the uh, set bounds or of the original uh, of the original bitmap. So there is a uh, mirror repeat. Uh, which do exactly what you would expect them to. Uh, and there is clamp. Clamp is the most efficient one. It means basically I don't care what is outside of my bounds. So if you paint somewhere with uh, using a tile mode, which is uh, clamp, whatever is outside of the bounds you've set might look like that, like garbage. You don't know what's in there. They don't care. So. Shaders, we've seen them, but there are a few kind of shaders. Uh, actually, there are three main families of shaders. Um, the most important ones are the bitmap shaders and the gradient shaders. So a bitmap shader is what you would use the tile mode with. So a bitmap shader is basically taking an image and drawing it somewhere. Uh, in this case, uh, if you say, uh, for example, I have two calls uh, there that I have painted a rectangle and a circle using a single image, again, the gnomes. Um, there are also um, gradient shaders. Gradient shaders uh, are of three kinds, linear, uh, radial, and sweep. Linear and radial are, well, intuitively. Sweep are, you know, like radars kind of thing, weird, nobody ever uses them, but y if you want, you can. If you want to draw a, a radar. Um, so yeah, these are the, th the two main ones. And then there is the Compose Shader. The Compose Shader is basically allowing you to uh, use more than one shader at once. So you can create a Compose Shader that is basically allowing you to apply two shaders instead of one. And if you are on hardware, a Compose shader can only have one bitmap shader and one uh, layout and one gradient shader inside. Uh, if you are on software, you can actually put Compose shaders inside of Compose shaders inside of Compose shaders and create a, a whole uh, tree of shaders if you need to for some reason. Um, and then what the Compose shader does is it calls both shaders and then composes the result of both of them using a, a transfer mode. Uh, transfer mode will see later what it is. Um, the second phase of the shading, uh, the second step of the shading phase is um, called color filters. Color filters are uh, in charge of adjusting the output of shaders, like tweaking the colors, basically. Uh, they apply a uniform transformation uh, that is the same for all pixels. So it's uh, it doesn't the color filter doesn't know the coordinate of the po of the pixel it's working on. So it's just like you can only have the same transformation for all, uh, which is anyway most of the case uh, in most of the cases enough. Um, there are again three main kinds of color filters. The first one is the most important one and the one with the longest name. Um, <laughs> color matrix color filter, it's a mouthful. Uh, and what it does is applying um, matrix transformation to the input colors. 
So you can use it, for example, to uh, take out uh, the saturation or uh, to change change the colors. For example, you can uh, simulate the sepia effect uh, for old photographs using a, a color matrix color filter. Um, or doing whatever you want. It's basically a free matrix transform that you can apply as you wish. Uh, then there is the lighting color filter, which um, multiplies the source color with the color you set, and then adds a second color to the result, like mathematically adds. And lastly, there is the portrait dot color filter, which takes a color parameter and the portrait dot mode and applies those, applies the color using the portrait dot mode to your uh, source stuff. Um, portrait dot modes, I'm not going to go through them, are basic, basically uh, like um, have you ever used Photoshop or any kind of graphics package? It's like when you have a layer and you set the the, uh, uh, the, the, the layer mode, the layer tr uh, fusion mode is like most of them are part of the part of the DAF modes. There are the stuff that that's mainly it. I just look it up on on, on the internet because uh, I'm lazy. Uh, then. Skipping through quickly, transfer modes. Uh, transfer modes is uh, the second step of the last phase of the SCIA pipeline. Uh, they are in charge of taking your source, uh, so whatever comes out of the rasterization phase, so the, the uh, alpha mask, and taking what comes out of the shading phase, which is the actual colors, and using them to paint on the buffer. Uh, there are three kinds, again, three, they like threes. Uh, three kinds of uh, transfer modes. The avoid transfer mode is uh, you set a color and a distance, a caloric metric distance, and then it basically filtering all the stuff that is uh, within or outside of the distance uh, from, the, from the color will get painted. Uh, the pixel XOR transfer mode will do a XOR of the values, like bitwise, and the portrait of transfer mode will use a uh, portrait of transform like add, multiply, mm, screen, whatever, uh, to um, to apply what comes out of previous phases into the final image. So this is it. I hope you didn't uh, you did understand what I said. Um, so if you have questions, now is the time, or later, or never. I don't mind. <laughs> so back there was a question about the two um, tables. Yeah. Okay, so he's asking if the um, capabilities of hardware rendering are varying by device or by API level? Uh, the answer is they should be varying by API level because it matter. what matters is what uh, Skia and the framework are able to do. Uh, in theory, if you, um, if you can update a device to a newer uh, Android version that supports more operations, then you should be able to do it. It's just a matter of, I guess, on the Skia team to have the time to implement the support for all the various operations on hardware. <laughs>